Hi guys, thanks for joining me again. Hope you're all keeping well. Welcome back to the channel. Well, sport has dried up again. I can't believe it. I got so excited back in October, but I did have a sneaky suspicion that I might just be Olympic cover uh, for PA, which is all well and good. The industry itself isn't isn't back to normal yet since COVID. I know some good mates of mine down south are only getting sort of four, six, sometimes at a push eight shifts a month when they've been on 15, 20. So the industry is still not back to normal yet. Whether or not a lot of the, the clients, the newspaper clients, are still pooling the, the images, I'm not sure. But for now, absolutely zero sport again, which is uh, why I'm doing another question and answers. So I'll just gone through some of your comments from the last three or four videos and picked out some questions that I think are relevant and might help you guys out. So yeah, fingers crossed the sport might go come back, but but we'll have to wait and see. It really is a, a, a suck it and see at the minute and uh, see, you know, time will tell. But um, it was great that I got a couple of shifts with with Prime Media. So thanks again to, to David and Andy for giving me them shifts. But um, that's obviously for Wickham Wanderers, and I suppose just as and when Wickham Wanderers are up north, perhaps another another job might come up, but we shall see. But for now, it's going to be um, back to landscapes and woodlands, I think. I do need to get back into the woodlands anyway. I, I am missing it, and now that the colours are so so fantastic with autumn, really must get out. So there might be a few more vlogs from the woodlands, and I might go on to the coast again and do a few waterfalls, but... Um, you know, that side of, because sport got quite busy, that side of my photography did uh, suffer a bit. So I'm going to revert back to that. But um, I might go and do a bit of the odd, you know, the, the grassroots sports, bit of football or a bit of rugby, just to try and keep the sport, you know, ticking over on the channel. Because I know the majority of you, like, you guys are sport photographers. So I'm going to carry on with that. Unfortunately, I had to send back the Canon kit, the 400 and the, the, the uh, 1DX Mark III. Can't thank Jackie and, and her team at Canon enough for, for allowing me to basically have really expensive bits of kit on loan for the best part of three months. So thanks ever so much, Jackie, and all the guys at Canon for, for tremendous ongoing support. I can't, I can't uh, big up the Canon support enough. It's absolutely fantastic, you know, whether or not you want servicing or whatever. On the CPS system, the Canon Pro Sports system, you can have you know bodies repaired down at fixation or wherever you choose within one or two days with the Canon support. So it's absolutely fantastic. Can't I can't uh, emphasize that enough. So thanks again, Jackie and, and all all the guys at Canon. But uh, anyway, I am actually just before I go on to the questions, I am borrowing a little uh, a three hundred two eight and the one DX off good mate Steve Paston, who's down on the south coast. So uh, thanks Steve for uh, allowing me to look after them for you for now. So if any sports jobs do come up you'll see me using the 300 28. So it'll be a bit different, but uh, um, it'll, obviously one or two of the questions are how do I choose or, or decide when to swap from the 400 to the 70 to 200? I know I covered it in one of my recent videos. So that'll be different. I'll be able to stay on the 300 for even longer. So the predicament of changing to the 70 to 200 will be, will be even longer now, but uh, we'll see how it goes when I do the next event. But Anyway, let's crack on with some of the questions. I'm boring you. So anyway, first question is, I've just screen grabbed them and put them on my phone. So if you see me looking down, it's because I'm reading the questions. But this is from Picky Man. How do you send images when the Wi-Fi bandwidth is being used up by the fans, like at half time or whatever? Well, good question that. Obviously, we're usually plugged in to, to the, to the Wi-Fi via an Ethernet cable. So it doesn't really affect us too much. The smaller lower league grounds, I'll rely on my Vodafone on the 4G being good. And if there isn't no stadium Wi-Fi, you know, that's that's designated just for the press photographers, which usually there is. So it's not usually a problem. We're either on the, the designated Wi-Fi for ourselves that, that obviously the fans don't don't tune into, don't log into, or we're on our own uh mobile phone, you know, bandwidth. So it's either 4G off the phone. I have got an EE card that I do carry around as well, a pay-as-you-go EE card that if my Vodafone isn't very good, I'll put the EE card into my uh, my, my dongle and use that. But um, yeah, usually it's not usually a problem. So uh, good question though, good question. Hope that answers it anyway. Right, what's the next question? This is from Harrogate Fan. Where did you get your seat from? <laughs> I get asked that so many times. The old Minimax stool. Uh, obviously, 
I'll put a link in the video in the description below just for you, but um, got it off eBay, about six, 56, 60 pound, I think. They come, you can pay a little bit more and get a black pad for the top of it. Mine's the 18 inch uh, version for my big bum. <laughs> but um, I know now there are a lot of copies on Amazon and on eBay, and I have seen quite a few of them in bits, pitch side or in the bin after the game. It just it does go to show that you only get what you pay for. I mean, these cheaper versions, I think they come in red and in all different colours. But really keep an eye out for the Minimax stool. That is the best. I'm quite a hefty guy, 16 and a half stone. I've had it, I think I've had mine five seasons now, and it has not let me down yet. I've even stood on it at an air show, you know, so it's taken my full weight and it's still perfect working condition. Like I say, I paid about 60 quid for it but you get what you pay for. So I'll put a link in the description below. They come from Israel, I think. Minimax stool, it's called. Link in the description and uh, go and get yourself one. I know he does keep selling out because they're such a popular stool. But um, yeah, I'll put the link in the description below anyway. Right. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Di Diaclam or Diaclam? <laughs> Just wondering why in the first half you were shooting in the sun. Oh, this is this, revert, this uh, recalls uh, a game that I did at Bournemouth with the linesman running past you when the opposite side wouldn't have had so many problems. Well, the opposite side is where the subs warm up. And I think this would have been probably second half, Bournemouth attacking to the, the home end. And I, we always plonk ourselves in that corner. Yes, you've got the linesman, but if I position myself about 10, 15 yards from the corner flag, then the linesman's usually past me and I can still capture the action. I think probably in this video, I'll have to look back again, but I think there was a, either a goal or a celebration or something, and the linesman was just running back. He was going back to the centre line, I think, back back to the for kickoff again after the goal. But as a rule, I'll, I'll risk the lino running past me because it's better than four or five substitutes on the other corner warming up in front of you and then you really are dodging and I have missed quite a lot in the past so yeah that'll be the reason that I was there I would think but um, hopefully that answers your question better to risk one body running past you if you can position yourself right than four or five subs warming up and you've just got a wall of, of substitutes and you can't see a thing you've literally got to get up and, and risk being told off by the stewards for moving during the game but uh, hopefully that answers your question anyway right Paul Hill Looking forward to getting, looking forward to you getting out shooting landscape photography again. Have you got anywhere any trips planned? I have, Paul. Yeah, like I just said at the start, with the sport drying up a bit, and uh, if I don't go and do uh, a, a non-league game or something or grassroots, then I will be heading out. Got a couple of waterfalls in mind up in in the in the North Yorkshire Moors. Now with the colours being nice and there'll be some nice colourful leaves in the waterfalls and get some nice swirls. So yeah, definitely a few trips planned. I have actually been sent a lightweight tripod from KNF Concept, so I must take that and I must make a video on that. Um, so again, might head up into the Lake District and do a bit of a, a hiking video and try out the lightweight tripod. So yeah, a few tri uh, trips in, in the plans, hopefully, Paul. So keep watching for them and uh, thanks for watching the videos. Right, Sean Pulich, I think, Pulich. To get the exposure compensation to work... I've actually chatted to Paul on Instagram, but I thought I'd bring this one up. Am I shooting in manual? He didn't think I was shooting in manual and I was using the exposure compensation. Well, it's in manual, Sean, as, as I've uh, explained to you. For anyone else that's struggling to use exposure compensation, it only works when you're in auto ISO. And then you have to... I'll put a, I'll put a screen grab up now, uh, um, a screen recording up now. Um, you have to... Choose your set button in the uh, custom controls, which I'll show you now, I'm showing you now. So you make the set button and you combine that with the top scroll button and then you can use the compens exposure compensation how you like. So yeah, I'm in manual, but auto ISO and it'll only work in auto ISO. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you've sorted that out, Sean, anyway, but yeah. Uh, Rob Productions. Hi Mark, another great video. What wide lens are you using? I'm using on my wide now on my 5D Mark IV, just for any celebrations that come over here. I'm using the 16 to 35 f4. I was on the 17 to 40 uh, f4 before that, but I found that if I wanted to do any um, 
shots before the game of the stadium, you know, the empty stadium, any general views as we call it, to start our set off. I, just that one mil difference, it was quite a, a quite amazing how one millimetre difference from the 16 to the 17 mil made a difference, both on my football general views and on the landscapes. Just that one mil difference, mate, it does make a heck of a difference. Obviously, it's a better lens than 16 to 35 as well. I found it a lot sharper, a lot better, a lot better glass. So yeah. For my wide angle stuff for sport and you know behind the goal or on the remotes or for my landscapes, I'm using the 16 to 35 f4 Canon 16 35 f4. I hope that helps, Rob. Alfie Cobold, I think it's Cobold or Cobold. Quality video again, Mark. Quick question Do you shoot in JPEG or RAW? Well, for sport, it's always JPEG. We don't need the large files really, um, and obviously. JPEG files are like four or five megabytes max, I should think, after we've cropped it. They send off straight away online, so they're gone in a flash if you've got a good, good Wi-Fi connection. Whereas obviously a RAW would be 15, 20 megabytes and it would take a lot longer. And also a lot longer processing speed as well. With my laptop being quite full, it's a bit of a dinosaur now. So if I'm working in RAW, then it takes ages. I did, however, shoot the Spot the Ball Rugby in RAW because... The guys back at back at to the editing suite obviously wanted good quality images and and no pixelation, so that was shot in RAW. And then one of you guys did notice. I can't think. Oh, sorry, I can't think of your name now. Um, did notice that I was at the football and my first warm up images were in RAW. That's simply because I forgot to change it back after doing the spot the ball rugby. But yeah, as a rule, all sport is in JPEG, and obviously all my landscape stuff is in RAW just to get that better quality and better better um, enhancement on the, on the editing. It just allows you, raw images allow you to edit a lot more and a lot more in, in depth and in detail than JPEGs, obviously. So yeah, sports, JPEG, landscapes, raw. Right, next, Kevin Cleaver. Any tips on fine tuning the white balance, please? I did briefly go over this in the last video under the floodlights. As a rule, I'll always shoot my, my sport in cloud. Just gives you a bit a bit better colour clarity, I, I think. Um, and it saves you having to edit quite as much and perhaps pumping up the colours a bit. So I always shoot in cloud. In the evening, I might go under the floodlights. I'm, like I said, I tried it in auto white balance, but it was a bit cold, so I went back to cloud. But I also use white balance shift. Um, and I think at Rotherham, I know I always revert back to um, Wembley or, or West Ham. Always comes out a bit green. So I'll go into um, the white balance shift and just give it a little bit of magenta or whatever in camera. And the more you can get set in camera, the less editing you have to do. So yeah, that would be the only tweaks that I would do is use my white balance shift just to give it a little bit of blue or, or whatever magenta. Um, like when I used to shoot at non-league Eastley, it was really yellow. So I'd just pop, pop a bit of blue in there and a bit of magenta and, and try and correct the colours that way in, in the, the white balance shift. Again, I'll put a, a bit of a video up now of um, the white balance shift, just showing you how I corrected how I corrected the light at, at uh, Rotherham, because I was finding I had to edit a little bit of magenta into it. So instead of doing it on the edit in Photoshop, I just did it in camera and then it saves, it saves a second or two on the edit. So yeah, white balance shift. Right, David Mag. Excellent work as usual, Mark. Given the time of year, I'd be interested in your views on good winter weather clothing for sports photography. Great question, this. Biggest issue I face each winter is keeping the hands warm. As once you lose the feeling in your fingers and thumbs on the right hand, you're in difficulty, which is true. Now, obviously, I, I sometimes... I've, I've got some fishing gloves and it's got some Velcro. I think... There are photography gloves out there now, but they're not cheap. Sort of, I know Simon Carlton. I think answered, answered, helped out David Mag and answered the question. I think I can't remember what they are now. I can't remember what. I'll I'll put a link in the description below and try and find out the details from Simon Carlton. So thanks for helping Dave out, Simon. But yeah, you can basically fold the fingers back and and just have your fingers and thumbs to work the controls. Another another system is. I know a good mate of mine, James Marsh, down on the south coast, he's got a, a USB hand warmer, and it's fantastic. Now, again, it's, it's a case of keeping it in your pocket, and I know it does last the whole game. I'm sure James said it lasted the whole game, and it is red hot. So you can basically put, when you're not operating, you can just hold it in your hands for you know a few minutes or whatever, or 10, 20 seconds, just to warm up and keep doing that. But there is no real way of doing it without 
feel, I mean, I like to feel the camera body and feel the lens and have total control, you know, because a lot of it is muscle memory and, and just touch when you're concentrating. So, so gloves are sometimes a bit clumbersome. But uh, yeah, that that USB hand warmer. I'll try and get the details off James and put it in the link in the description below. But yeah, any hand warmers like that. I've I used to have some old hand warmers that you'd boil up each time, but they don't last long. But the USB hand warmers seem to work quite well for James. So um, I'll put the links in the descriptions for the gloves and and for the for the hand warmer. And apart from that, really, it's just loads of layers, isn't it? I mean, I've, I, I I swear by my Berghaus um, puffer jacket and the waterproof leggings. I'll sometimes wear the waterproof leggings, even if I know it's not going to rain, just to keep keep warm. But uh, I, I I quite like the Berghaus stuff. But there's lots out there now. But uh, anyway, hope that answers your question, David. Right next, um, <laughs> Turnip Madras. That's a good name, isn't it? Great shots. Tried rugby photography at a local club where I had full access to all the touchlines, so could follow the play a little. But even then, I got I got anxious about missing action that is far too far away on this seventy to two hundred. How do you cope with that when stuck in one location? Well, to be honest, apart from the the spot the ball stuff that I did where I was moving about, like Premier League and Championship, you are glued to one position. And it's just a, a case of hoping that you get lots of action within your range or on the 400. But, you know, with, with um, this guy just... Uh, I wish you'd put your name instead of Turnip Madras. I can't say Turnip. <laughs> But uh, with you only having the 70 to 200, if you're doing your lower league stuff, then yeah, it is best to try and keep up with it. But it's something that I've not done much of moving about. I know at Bournemouth, if there was a new manager turn up, an away, away team manager, we are allowed at Bournemouth, well, before COVID, to sit right at the dugout for 10 minutes and then just make our way back to our position for the rest of the game, which was great. But a lot of grounds, you choose your spot and you're there for the half. You know, sometimes you can't even move at half time. But um, yeah, so I've never really done the wandering about. I don't know if I'd be comfortable with it or not, whether I could walk and keep an eye on it. I'd, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be the opposite. I'd be scared of missing something while I'm moving. You know, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a new one on me. But yeah, I suppose we're lucky having the, the big, the big prime lenses where we can switch, you know, from the 70 to 200 to the 400, which really, if you're going to do sport seriously, you do need two lenses. You need that prime and you need your 70 to 200. So I suppose we're lucky that we've got that option. But but yeah, I suppose your best option would be to, to move about, if you can, with the 70 to 200. But uh, yeah, tricky question to answer that one. But in a, in an ideal world, you, you'd probably try and, try and get a, a prime lens as well, just to cover your back. But uh, anyway, Brian Tempest. Hi Mark, great video as per usual. What setting would you use for shooting directly into sunlight at games? Again, quite a, quite a tricky one that. There isn't really a way round shooting into the sun. Um, a video that I did at Bournemouth where I got caught out, I went to my usual corner spot for the second half where the away fans were and it was dull and overcast. And then halfway through the second half, I think it was Chelsea, Chelsea versus Bournemouth, they scored... I think it was Fernando Alonso, uh, not Fernando Alonso, he's a blooming F1 driver. Alonso uh, scored, and just as he scored, the sun came out right above the stand, and all I got was a haze, a mess of haze, and didn't get the goal. Or I got his celebration, obviously, when he ran past me, but and I got the fans celebrating, but I didn't get the goal. I don't think that, I mean, obviously, lens hoods, they can help you out a bit. Or even, even before now, if it's been a corner or something and I've been caught out, caught out, I will try and just get rid of the haze a little bit with my hand, but it doesn't really work. Once you're into haze, best thing to do is move. But obviously, at Bournemouth, we're not allowed to move, you know, halfway through a second half, really. We, you could do, but the, but, um, the stewards are quite hot and if you're moving about and walking in front of the fans, they don't like it and I don't like doing it. So, it's, you've just got to suck it up, really. So you could keep an eye on your ISOs, I suppose, and, and try and get a faster shutter speed. But once that haze is there and you're into the sun, it's very difficult to escape it. So I would say if you can, move. But um, obviously I couldn't at Bournemouth, so got caught out a bit. But good question, good question. And not really answered it properly, to be fair, settings-wise, anyway. But uh, anyway, Richard Pill. Love watching the videos. I'm amazed at the low light performance of the 1DX. The images are really clean, even at higher ISOs, coupled with the 400 28 Mark II. The combination is amazing, and it was an amazing bit of kit combined. Are you seeing much difference between the 1DX and the earlier versions? Yes. I mean, just for a start, 
the shutter rate was fantastic, especially for the spot the ball stuff. You know, all I wanted was the ball being released on the rugby and then getting as many frames as I could before the next player caught it, because obviously that would be great for the spot the ball. And I was finding that I was getting five or six frames from the ball being released to the next player catching it. Whereas oh, I did have I did have, I did do one game with the 1DX Mark 1 on the 400 and I got probably three frames. So just alone the shutter speed was fantastic. The shutter rate, frames per second, was was immense. And like Richard says, I was shooting at, at Rotherham, I think I was shooting at 10,000 ISO to keep my shutter speed to about 1250th at f2.8 and there was no noise whatsoever. Didn't have to use noise reduction. The the, the sensor size, I think it's, uh, is it 21, 21 or 22 peg, megapixel sensor on the 1DX Mark III? So still quite small, but so much better on the ISO ranges. I could have probably gone to 16,000, I think, before I saw any noise whatsoever. But 1250th was enough for me at Rotherham. So, and it, like I said, it, I really did notice the difference. I didn't have to use any noise reduction at all. It was set. It was set to zero, you know. So, and didn't have to take any noise out in the edit either. So yeah, definitely noticed the difference with the One DX Mark III. But I can't afford a One DX Mark III, not at the minute. So. Uh, I'm, I say I'm borrowing Steve's 1DX Mark One at the moment, so just have to watch them ISOs a bit. But I think I think even the 1DX Mark One, the original, can handle the ISOs quite well at six six thousand four hundred. You know, but anything above that, you are noticing a little bit of noise and have to use the noise reduction. Incidentally, which I use in camera, I'll put it up to the the second setting in noise reduction or something like that, just to just so that I have to I don't have to do quite as much in the edit. But uh, yeah, the Mark Three. Heck of a piece of kit, and I was sad to see it go back, but uh, one day I might own one, but anyway, we'll see. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Richard. Did notice a lot of difference. John Middleton, doesn't your neck hurt with the 70 to 200 with that strap, and doesn't it stress on the, the mount? Well, I suppose it does a bit, because the, the 70 to 200 2.8 version is quite a heavy lens, um, but as long as you keep your maintenance up, and keep an eye out on the screws, on your bayonet fittings, on both the lens cap and on on the the body itself. Just keep them just keep them tight. Then there's there's no real issue swinging about. It probably looks quite bad, for, you know, swinging it down to go back to the 400 and then picking it up again. But I've never had an issue with the 70 to 200 coming loose at all. And um, it is a heavy lens, but it's it's not that heavy. The, the 1DXs are built so well that. Um, there's no real issues with it. And to be honest, I usually, I think you've probably seen in the videos, I usually put my hood up and then put the strap round my hood, probably hood and my coat hood, and then you've just got a little bit of padding around your neck. So doesn't it, it probably looks still quite tight, but but uh, don't really notice it actually in the game. I know some lads use the, the shoulder harnesses, which I did used to use, but I found that it hung too low and I just... I found that the shoulder strap would then move, and I just I just prefer that to have the the body hanging either between my legs or to the side, just so that I can quickly get it, as you've seen in the video. So yeah, yeah, no real issues with that, John. So thanks for the question, Debbie Gold. Thanks, Mark. Floodlights are so much better than the ones that I have to work with. Sadly, my ISO is much higher. I think I've just covered this one actually. I see somewhere else has asked the question whether you use noise reduction. Great question, Debbie. Obviously on the 1DX Mark I, I will use noise reduction in camera and then probably a little tweak in Photoshop as well on the, the camera raw uh, filter. But um, obviously on the Mark III, it was absolutely fine. But um, it really is a balancing act between controlling your ISOs, having a good enough shutter speed, exposure time, and then obviously your f-stop, so 2.8 if you can. If you're at f4, then you probably will have to come down a bit on your shutter speed to probably 800th. I know once at Eastley, the, the floodlights were that, were that poor, if you like, without without slating Eastley too much, because that's where I started. I was shooting at 640th, I think. So ball was totally blurred. You've really got a pan with the players, but um, just to keep my ISO down as well. But um, a lot of clients, a lot of papers, accept that you're going to have grainy shots at a night game unless you've got top top kit which a lot of us can't afford me included so they do they do accept that the images are going to be a bit noisy but uh, yeah it really is a balancing act between keeping the iso down 
and keeping your shutter speed sort of 800th to 1250th if you can. Obviously, if you've got a 2.8, it's you know a little bit more of an advantage. But uh, yeah, so noise reduction I will use in camera um, and whack that right up if I'm at a, a ground, you know, non-league ground. I'll have it on I'll set on on the third setting and um, just do as much as you can in camera and then just probably take the texture slider down a bit in in the camera raw filter. But uh, yeah, good question that Debbie. Thank you. Eric Brandt, great bit as usual. Are you doing any noise reduction? I've just covered it. <laughs> I would imagine that the 1DX Mark III is much better than my 7D. Unfortunately, Eric, yeah. I had a 7D Mark II and I dreaded using it at night games because it, it just couldn't handle ISO, high ISOs. Anything over 3,200 and the 7D Mark II was really struggling. So that's why I ended up, ended up selling it because I was using it for the the goal remote and obviously as soon as you want to crop anything in or pull anything in on a night game oh my light's just gone out it was uh it was really struggling but uh, yeah the 7d mark ii did struggle great camera fantastic quality in good light conditions but in low light conditions the 7d mark ii really did struggle with anything over iso 3200 so yeah might be fine finding that you have to use quite a lot of noise reduction to keep your shutter speed up at night games, Eric, but uh, fingers crossed you're managing all right anyway. Right, Tommy, good to have your footy videos back. <laughs> Shame they've gone again now, but anyway. So a nil-nil board draw. How many images am I sending over to the club social media person during the match? Well, I think the nil-nil draw, I really struggled to send top quality images off. I could have sent lots more images off, but not really great quality. I think the Rotherham game, I sent around 40 odd, 45 images off to the social media guy. Um, you know, I really was struggling and not a lot. I think I said at the end of the video, how, you know, you always feel guilty when you don't send a real top quality, strong set off, but you can only get what's in front of you. I think, I think it was about 40, 45 in the end. I mean, there was, I got some good yellow cards. I got some good tackling, some, um, some of the manager, you've really got to just, you know, shoot out your, out your comfort zone and try and find lots, lots to try and capture. If there's nothing happening on the pitch, keep an eye on the bench. Some, you know, there might be a player that's not played for ages, getting warmed up. He might not even come on. That could be a story. It's just a case of trying to find something that could go along with the story, especially at a nil-nil draw. Why is it nil-nil? You know, have, have, have both keepers made great saves? They could be the story. You know, you've really got to think outside the box a bit and try and find a, an image for a story on a nil-nil draw. You know, you might not have the action in front of you, but um, yeah, I think I, I think I sent about forty odd off. Sometimes on a on a busy game, if it's two all or, or you know or two three two or something, you might send seventy or eighty images off. You know, because you've got extra celebrations, you've got a set a sequence for each goal. But on the whole, that nil-nil board draw, as I called it. Was uh, was about forty five images, I think. But uh, anyway, best just put this ISO up a bit now that my this light has run out. I didn't think it'd last long. So thanks for that, Tommy. <clears throat> right, Andrew McLean, thanks for the video. You appear to have a similar kit to myself, although I don't use a third body with the wider lens. I might try that next season. Roughly how far from the sideline are you along the baseline? So obviously, I usually position myself as we all do on the goal line, and I will always try and get around the 18-yard line if I can. That way I think that I can get a good shot of the goal. I've got a good angle for any any celebrations that happen on the far corner if they celebrate the other side of the goal. I've got a good chance of getting the players running towards me if they're going to head for the corner flag on a celebration. But usually, second half, especially if you've got the fans behind you, I'll always sit on the 18-yard line, on the 18-yard box line, because nine times out of ten, you'll get the celebration. Might peel off, it might just be to your left, could be just to your right, but you've got a, you've got a good option of getting a nice celebration over the top of you. Very much like at Wickham, uh, at the uh, away game at Doncaster, when Wickham celebrated, they were literally on the 18-yard line. So as a rule, if I can, I'll head for the 18-yard line usually. So thanks for that, Andrew. Right, I'll get back to that. The recording just stopped. So yeah, uh, Daryl V49, great content as always. The frustrations of being a sports photographer, missing the opening goal. Interested to know who makes the decision or how do you decide which games to attend? 
Great question, actually. I'm just going to turn that ISO down a bit. It's gone a bit bright now. There we are. It's a great question, that actually, Daryl. When I was on commission at Action Plus, I chose where I wanted to go. I sent in an email to say, I quite fancy that game this week, this game, this game, and this game. Can you apply for me? Send me to which, whichever one we get, we get uh, accepted for, which is fine. But once your agency are sending you to their desired game, then really they should be paying you a shift because they are dictating where you go. So when I was on commission for Action Plus, I said I'd like these games. I gave them a handful of options. Usually it was in London when I was down south. So I gave them an option, a, a, a handful of games. They obviously applied for all of them. Then they said, you've been accepted here, here and here. Which one do you want to go to? So I then chose because I was on commission. I called the shops, if you like. Whereas when I was fortunate enough to work for PA, they told me where they wanted me to cover and I just went. But that's obviously when I was getting paid a shift. So yeah, it really does vary. If you're on commission, don't get bullied into going to certain games that you don't really want to go to because you're not getting paid to do it. So uh, yeah, that's what I would say. If you're on commission, you choose where to go. And if you're on shift and you're hired by, you freelance for a certain company or for a certain agency, they, they're well in, within their rights to ask you where to go. And uh, you just go wherever. And luckily, obviously, I love the job. And I didn't mind whether I was doing non-league Eastley or, or you know, um, I was quite fortunate to do a couple of um, women's premiership games. So that was good. Women, women's uh, Super League games. So that was good. So, yeah, I just went wherever I was asked when I was at PA and, uh, and it worked really well. But, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Daryl. Well, Eric's back again. <laughs> Interested to see how your exposure compensation in the sun and the shade. Any tips would be great. Cheers for the great vid. So, yeah, exposure compensation. I've roughly covered it earlier on, actually. I've not really uh, looked into these questions very well, have I? But, um, yeah, exposure compensation. It really is a case of hit that set button, alter the wheel, take a quick look. I usually found that I had to lower my exposure compensation when I was doing the managers, when it was quite low light in the dugout. If you took one during the day, it would overexpose it. So I'd always knock it down a few stops, take a quick shot. We've got, we've got the luxury of looking on the back of the screen now, double check it, and then just alter it to suit. And it is, it's as easy as that really, Eric. Suck it and see a bit, take a shot, look on the back. I think I did it in the last video, actually. There was a corner coming up, and because I was facing, I was shooting towards a big band of, of floodlights, I just took a quick shot of the goal mouth, looked on the back of the screen, and then altered the compensation to suit. So yeah, if you've got time, always just take one, sh one frame, check it, and then alter it to suit. So that's what I would recommend you do it, and it really is as easy as that. I've been caught out before where I've done the managers, and I've, I've knocked it down a few stops, and then there's been a bit of action quick, so I've gone back on the 400, took a few frames, and it's been slightly overexposed, and I've had to correct it in Photoshop, but... But yeah, it really is as easy as that. Just take a shot and then double check it. Thanks for that, Eric. Todd Bristol. Hey, Mark. Love your channel. Question around the settings. I'm assuming those were primarily daytime settings. Oh, that's when I did the settings video. Can you describe the differences between what you do for day and night games? Yeah. Basically, ISO commands your shutter speed, basically, to a certain extent anyway. As a rule, on a day game, I'll be at 2,000th of a second if I can. Probably at ISO four, six hundred, something like that. Certainly on that that Mark three, I was, and obviously that's fine. F two point eight, F three point two, uh, and the same goes for my seventy to two hundred. I'd be at at least sixteen hundredth to two thousandth if I could shutter speed. Again, ISO four six hundred. Obviously a night game, those ISOs are going to ramp right up. They're going to fly up. So I was down to twelve fiftieth, sometimes a thousandth just to try and keep that ISO down to 10,000 uh, ISO on the Mark III, which didn't affect it at all. Obviously, if I was on, a, on the 1DX on my 70 to 200, I might be down to a thousandth at ISO 6400 in the goal mouth. They're usually quite well lit. But yeah, it really does, it does depend. Obviously, 2.8 if you can, if you've got the luxury of having a 2.8 lens. I know some of you guys have got F4s then you've really got to watch your ISOs a bit more and perhaps just lower your shutter speed a little bit more because like I said earlier, clients are well aware that certain certain uh, grounds aren't that great great with the floodlight. So yeah, so it's a balancing act between 
a high in ISO as you dare go to and as low a shutter speed as you dare go to in f2.8 or f4. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Todd. Justin Cliff, following up on this exchange of views, oh yeah, basically, if I had the choice, would I like to roam or would I like to sit down in one position? And for me, it would be sit down in one position because I've got the luxury of having the, the 400 or the 300 now as I've got. So I can, I can swap. I think if you've got lower end kit, I probably would roam a bit, you know. I mean, I know when I started at, at um, when I first started at Eastleigh, I had the 70 to 200 and a 100, 400 pump zoom. And that got me by quite nicely, actually. And then obviously I traded in the 100, 400 zoom for a 400, 28, a Mark 1, 400, 28. But um, yeah, if I had the choice, because that's what I've always done, really, it's, it's a bit out of my comfort zone to roam because I'd still be afraid that while I was roaming and looking down and walk, looking where I'm walking, I might not have time to grab the action. Whereas at least if you're not on the 70 to 200 close in, you're on the 400 following the action all the time. So yeah, I, if, I think I would carry on the way I am and, and probably probably leave the roam in to, to someone else. But uh, yeah, I'd definitely uh, choose to sit in the one position and just hope that you get the action. Doesn't always happen as you've seen in my videos. You know, I mean, when I when I missed that first goal at um, at Doncaster Rovers, when I missed the Wickham goal, it was literally ten seconds. Well, I say ten seconds. Probably it took me a minute to get from one end to the other, and by the time I'd got to the corner flag, they'd scored. Now, in hindsight, I should have sat because I knew it was a free kick, but I tried my best to try and get round front side of the attack, and I missed that free kick. In hindsight. I don't really like to shoot players' backs. I think it's a bit frowned upon in the industry to, to have any players' backs in the frame. So I tried to get round best I could. But um, in hindsight, I perhaps should have risked it, sat where I was on the 400 and just done that. And I might have got some of the goal. But um, I certainly wouldn't have got any of the celebration. It would have just been backs. But um, yeah, in hindsight, that's what I should have done. So roaming, I suppose that's similar. But uh, anyway, I hope that answers your question, Justin. Right, Sydney, as in the Australian Sydney. Question, would an 18 to 400 lens work for high school? Just covered that really. Because um, I'm working with a 70 to 200 at the moment. I would say if it's just for high school and, there's, and you're not taking the shots, you're not being hired by anyone and you're not trying to sell the images, then an 18 to 400 gives you a massive scope. Obviously it's going to be F, I'm presuming F4 to F, 5.6 so your depth of field's not going to be very good but you'd certainly get a lot more action than on the 70 to 200 I'm not sure you don't say if it's a 70 to 200 28 or not but um, yeah the 18 to 400 combined with the 17 to 200 the 70 to 200 you know you'd have you'd have a good option for some good quality stuff on the 70 to 200 but then you've also got that wide and that distance at the 18 to 400 so yeah Definitely worth a go. I so say you're not going to get quite the depth, you know, like at 2.8 on the 400, everything behind the subject, behind the player, is nice and soft. It's totally, and it really does enhance the player. Whereas with that, I would say at 400 on the 18 to 400, you'd probably be at f5.6 or f6.1, so your depth's not going to be as good, but you'd certainly capture a lot more action. So yeah, probably give it a go. And if, if you're on our photography chat page on Facebook, you know, post some of your action shots on the 18 to 400 if you do get it and, uh, and keep us posted. But uh, yeah, thanks for that, Sydney. Oh, and that's it. That's all the questions. <laughs> so, um, and that's, I've gone back, right back down my comments right to the last Q&A. So uh, yeah, probably a good job because it's probably about 25 minutes long now. But uh, hopefully that's helped you out, guys. Anyway, like I say, I'm going to go back and uh, probably head into the woodlands this weekend and uh, perhaps nip up to the Lake District and do some waterfall stuff, but <clears throat> I've still got the 300 that Steve's kindly lent me and the 1DX, so a couple of weeks' time I might go and find some grassroots football on a Saturday afternoon or something and uh, just try and keep up with the sports content as well. But um, definitely this weekend I'm going to head back out into, into, the, into the woodlands, I think, and try and capture some colour. But um, anyway... Thanks ever so much for watching, guys, and thanks ever so much for your support and your continued support in buying me coffees on my Kofi page. Can't thank you enough, guys. The coffees are trickling in, and uh, it really does help 
you know, with a bit of fuel or if I'm traveling, traveling to a game, it just really, really helps out. And um, who knows, I might, if, I'm, if, if the shifts aren't going to come back, I am slightly tempted to join an agency on commission again. Just to keep my eye in, really, at, at the bigger the bigger games, you know, because I've got Leicester down the road, I've got Leeds down the road, um, Sheffield United, Barnsley, uh, Nottingham Forest. They're all within an hour and a half away, so I might even be tempted to join a, an agency on commission just to keep my eye in and keep a bit of sport going on the channel, you know. But um, we shall see, see how the next few months go, and um, yeah, jobs are good. Un. Thanks ever so much for watching, guys. Keep in touch. Keep posting your, your work on the photography chat page on Facebook and um, catch up next week. Thanks, guys. Take care. Catch up soon.